Let's see how fast we can get this done. Today is the 139th anniversary of the passing of the Chinese Exclusionary Act that was enacted by the United States and signed into law by President Arthur. Chester A. Arthur. I have notes. So, today I want to talk about the Chinese Exclusionary Act and the act that predates it, which would be the Page Act that was signed into law in 1975. No, sorry, 1875. Doing my math. Right. Anyway, the Page Act we will talk about before we talk about the Chinese Exclusionary Act, but I wanted you to know that today is the 139th anniversary of the passing of that law. Now, to make this more interesting for everybody, <laughs> I thought I would try to do my makeup again because apparently everybody enjoyed it last time, and I know that like this whole like mystery and makeup and and things. Our thing, so we're gonna do some history and makeup, which I'm sure is already a thing, and I'm late to the party. But I have already prepared my palette, my face, with all of my post face washing ointments and oils, and so I would like to set use that to set the tone for the history of the first ever exclusionary act enacted by the United States based on ethnicity and or race, which would be the Page Act, not the Chinese Exclusionary Act. So the Page Act, to understand the Page Act, you have to understand Chinese immigration into the United States back during the gold rush era. So there's a lot more to this than we're going to go into because uh, there's a lot more to this than we're going to go into. Basically, before China, or before the United States started importing Chinese workers into the United States, they were, well, we were a slave state. We had slaves, <laughs> so we didn't need outside help. After the uh, Civil War, which effectively ended slavery, Uh, kind of. We started, we, the United States, started needing, um, cheap labor. Now, the British had already started doing this particular practice of bringing in Chinese and Indian, India, Indian from India, labor to their colonies to basically be indentured servants, which is basically a fancy way of saying slavery. Um, basically by misleading a lot of these immigrants as to what they were getting into. So, no, I'm not putting a primer on my face because I've already put on a um, moisturizing primer, so if you're wondering, there you go. And no, I don't know the name of it because it was a sample that I got from the makeup store when I bought all of my face masks, so sorry. Uh, but I am going to be using Wet n Wild's Photo Focus Found on Detent in rose ivory which i already know is way too light for my skin right now um so we're gonna go with a goth look today uh i thought it looked kind of nice and i think it'll go nice with my brand new red hair <sighs> so since we have primed the pump by talking about uh why we the united states started importing chinese labor into the united states and you may have heard the term coolie used to describe early Chinese immigrants to the United States, early Chinese labor in the United, uh, United States West, the American West. So I had to do some research on this, and from what I can figure out, the term coolie is not, I mean, it is a slang term, but it's a British slang that means colonies, I believe. And it was used to refer to not just Chinese labor, but also Indian labor that they were bringing in to work in the colonies, aka coolie labor. And I guess we picked it up and we used it in some of our laws because we, we used to use slang terms in our laws. Anyway, we have the pre-foundation. We have the primer. So the foundation of this is that the United States had a gold rush. I don't know if you've heard about it. It happened in California. It was a thing for a while. Um, we needed labor 
to do the mining and to help establish the infrastructure that would allow not only for easier access to mining, but also to build this little thing called the Transcontinental Railroad that went from one end of the country to the other, and also all of the lumber needs that we had doing all of this. You need lumber to mine. You need lumber to build a transcontinental railroad. You need lumber to build the houses for the people that are building the transcontinental railroad and mining all of the gold and silver and stuff. Ooh, that is, that's pale. Oh yeah. Hey Casper, what's up? Got some lunch, so I want to jump with you. Anyway, so we bring in all of this Chinese labor and we did bring over Indian labor as well. So we're bringing in all this, we're mainly focusing on Chinese labor right now. So we bring in all this Chinese labor and there's a, a misunderstanding that when we brought the Chinese immigrants to America and put them to work, that we weren't paying them very well, we being the United States. Please understand what I'm saying, we, I mean the royal we as in the United States. So there's this misunderstanding that Chinese labor was cheap. According to a lot of the historical records that we have on file that predate the Exclusionary Acts, Chinese labor wasn't necessarily cheap. It Most Chinese laborers were making, if not the same amount as their non-Chinese counterparts, sometimes even more because they came over as skilled labor. So especially when we're looking at like the lumber mills and the logging towns, Chinese laborers came over already knowing how to do a lot of that logging and a lot of that lumber moving because they were doing it in China. So they came over with a set of skills that we were already needing. So of course, back before we were a bunch of buttholes, not that that was ever a long period of time or really any period of time, we did pay the Chinese workers the same amount, and sometimes more, depending on their skill level. Which of course ticked off people who were not Chinese, specifically guys who were required, who were classified as white by the culture at that time, because they thought they were better. And that's literally the only reason behind it. <laughs> um, still getting foundation. We're using the Wet n Wild Photo Focus Fond du Tent et Baton um, in ivory. Shell ivory. Again, these are my winter shades. But they'll be fun. I like to use this as concealer. Mainly because I think it sticks better. And since we're doing concealer, things that were also often concealed by history. When Chinese immigrants first started coming over to America, they were almost 99% male. We didn't have a lot of female immigrants. A lot of that was because, well, Chinese immigrants. A lot of that was because the men would come over looking to establish themselves in the United States to make a amount of money and to bring their families over. Because most of the people who were coming over here were coming to stay. They planned to maybe not become American citizens, but they were definitely planning on staying here in America because land of opportunity and all that. The problem is California specifically started freaking out really badly about how many Chinese people were in the area. Now, this first act that we're going to talk about, the Page Act, got signed into law by Ulysses S. Grant. And a lot of people don't know much about Ulysses S. Grant because we just don't know a lot about him. He's kind of looked down on as one of the dopier presidents of the United States, which is, in my humble opinion, completely um, wrong. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant was actually a very socially proactive progressive, socially progressive president for the time. For the time. If you brought Ulysses S. Grant to the modern day, he would probably die of a heart attack. Just FYI. However, Ulysses S. Grant had President Ulysses, or President Grant, 
had a really good relationship with the Chinese um, government of the time, which I believe was a chancellor. I don't know, and I apologize. But he liked the Chinese, and he appreciated the Chinese immigrants and the Chinese labor that they brought with them. And he understood the... He understood that the labor that the Chinese immigrants put forth into America were instrumental to the development and the progress that America was able to enjoy. We would not have built the Transcontinental Railroad without Chinese labor. We would not have been able to mine the California Gold Rush and the m minerals in other states without Chinese labor. We would not have been able to keep the log camps and the logging going without Chinese labor. And Ulysses S. Grant knew this. And so he was very sympathetic to Chinese immigrants. Now, because of that, when California started freaking out, he told them no. The first time. So, Congress decided that it wanted to pass this exclusionary law because Congress was actually concerned about terms that we're not going to use, but basically Chinese immigration. Okay, my camera keeps dying. Well, so let's see if we can get this done. So anyway, uh, the Chinese were mostly male. They were bringing their wives and children over after the fact. So for whatever reason, well, we know what the reason was. So California decides that or Congress decides that they're going to pass an act. It's called the Page Act, named after the senator who put it forward, who I think also is the guy that put forward the Exclusionary Act that comes up like seven years later. Anyway, um, they put forth this act, put forward the Page Act, and the Page Act basically says no Asian women. Now, it says it in a much fluffier way that makes it hard for Grant to say no because they couch it in the language of we're preventing indentured servitude and we're preventing uh, forced prostitution. And we're doing that by making it impossible for women to immigrate, for Asian women specifically, to immigrate into the United States because obviously... Asian women are the problem when it comes to prostitution. So you can see that there's this early sexualization of Asian women. A problem we still have today. So another thing that's interesting to note here, though, is that um, prostitution wasn't illegal in the state of California at the time. So this fear of the immoral Asian woman homewrecker coming over to the United States to be a prostitute should not have been an issue at the time. Because prostitution, again, wasn't illegal. But what it did do is it effectively prevented for seven years Chinese and Asian men from being able to bring their wives and mothers and any real family member other than their male family members over to the United States, which effectively cut them off from it cut them off from their own social groups. Because also keep in mind that the United States is notoriously bad about not liking people intermixing with groups that are not their own group. So who are these Chinese people marrying? Who are these Chinese men marrying? Well, they're marrying the Indians they're, uh, from India. They're marrying uh, Native American women. They're marrying Hispanic women. Hispanic and Latino women at the time, because remember, California. And they're marrying groups that we would consider white today, but were not considered white during that time. So, but like the Irish, the Germans, the Polish, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, you know, my family. Not that I have Asian in my family, I don't. So, we uh, we're going to move on to my eyes. And the whole inspiration for me doing makeup was that I found this old palette of mine. It's so a little bit of makeup archaeology. This is a Naked 3 Urban Decay palette. It's several years old. <laughs> Probably shouldn't be using it, but whatever. I think it's been used twice in its lifetime. So, we're going to use it today. Alright, so, 
We've gotten to the Page Act, which basically says no Asian women are allowed into the United States. We've got roughly seven years of Chinese immigrants being able to get to America as long as they were male or passing as male at the time. Remember, just because you pass a law that says people can't do things doesn't mean people don't find a way to do it. Especially if it's something they really, really want. So we're going to use, uh, we're going to use Nooner from the Naked 3 palette from way back in the day. I don't even know if they make this palette anymore. Um, jump forward to the 1870s. Let me double check my dates. Jump forward to the 1882 to the 1880s. And Chinese immigrants have managed to spread out not only into California, but also into a lot of the Western states across the Midwest and they're making their way to the East Coast at this point. And there's a lot of them. They're good at what they do. They're good workers. They're desired workers. And because of the transcontinental railroad that they effectively built, they could get from one side of the country to the other. Well, the country is now freaking out because in some places, the Chinese population actually outnumbers the population of any other racial group at the time. In some locations. And this has a lot of people worried. Because they're afraid that they're going to be taken over by Chinese people. People have really weird fears. Anyway, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, and remember we have a new president at this point. This is now a... Uh, What's his name? Arthur. Chester A. Arthur's presidency now. Congress and the president decide that they need to do something about this menace. And yes, this is how it's referred to. So they pass. Now remember, we've already got the Page Act, which basically excludes any Asian woman from getting into the country, specifically Chinese women. Wasn't good enough. So now, with the fear of being overrun by Chinese immigrants in the United States, the United States decides to officially close its borders once and for all to an entire racial group. An entire ethnic group. Because remember, America's not great at being able to determine this, the differences between one ethnic group and another. So when we passed this Chinese Exclusionary Act, we didn't just exclude the Chinese. I mean, we did, but since we can't really tell the difference between Chinese and Japanese and any other person from Asia, we basically said nobody from Asia gets to come over. This is the first major law that the U.S. has ever passed basically stating that one particular ethnic group was not welcome at all in the United States. And, and the act itself didn't get repealed until 1943. We had this law on the books for a long time. And because we had this law on the books, it made it easier for us to exclude other ethnic groups that we didn't like or didn't want to like, or were afraid of, or just in general wanted to be dicks to. However, what it didn't take into account was all of the Chinese that were already here. And all of the groups that we're identifying now as Chinese Americans. Because these are now American citizens, not immigrants, who are now born and raised in the United States and even though they weren't white, they were still American citizens. So what did we do? Well, a lot of different things happened throughout the years. Um, a lot of different laws kind of rebuffed and passed back. I'm not going to lie. A lot of the things that were able to get done were because of the corporations at the time that valued the Chinese labor forces that they had. 
Remember, just because something's illegal doesn't mean people aren't going to do it. And since Chinese labor was, at this point, cheaper because they didn't have the ability to defend their right to work and their right to a living wage anymore, which they did have prior to these laws, it fell on the corporations to support them and protect them, basically. And there was a lot of anti-Asian and anti-Chinese sentiment in the United States. I mean, anybody who's ever looked at anything historical from that period knows that. I promise you I'm going somewhere with this. Just give me a second or I'm going to stab myself in the eyeball. And I've done so good with this so far. I don't want to screw it up. So, here's where the myth of cheap Chinese labor starts to grow. Because now Chinese don't have the rights to protect themselves and the laws to protect themselves. And earlier, I'm not trying to say that the corporations were good people and blah 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 and all that. No, they really weren't. They just, at this particular point in time, that's lovely. This is why I don't like black, black eyeshadow. Uh, mascara. Anyway, they were just protecting their bottom line by protecting their workers, which, you know, props, but well, it looks better on camera than it does in real life, so we're going to leave it with that. So that's what that really all boiled down to. However, they were protecting their workforce. It did give Chinese Americans some protection. Didn't necessarily give them protection under the law, but it gave them some protection jump forward, we start passing regular laws. Asian Americans, who are now Asian Americans, now have rights under the American laws because they are Americans, and they start pushing back. Now, again, Chinese exclusionary law did not get repealed until 1943, I was going to say 6, 1943. So this is a law that is actually relatively new off of our lists. It pushed Chinese Americans away from the most desirable skilled labors and into things like grocery stores into things like laundries and other jobs that people thought were beneath them, white Americans thought were beneath them, and regulated the service industry for unskilled labor. Now, y'all, we just went through a pandemic. If you took away all of this unskilled labor all of a sudden, as we did, our economy comes to a screeching halt. So... When you say unskilled labor, what you really mean is the job I don't want to do. I am using... Remmel of London's Stay Matte Liquid Lip Color and... It's super dark. And I am... Ooh, look at me! Well, it ain't perfect. And I don't line my lips. Because I'm lazy. But there's our finished look. I think the point that I'm trying to make here with my last minute ranting as I put on my lipstick was that Chinese labor started off as being highly prized and highly skilled in the United States because of what it was. The lumber industry, the mining industry, and then the railroad industry. It wasn't until we, the United States, started passing laws that basically excluded foreign labor, not just Chinese labor, but foreign labor in general, from being treated as same or equal to white labor at the time that Chinese labor started to become cheap, perceived as lesser, and that the Chinese workforce began to be... to the Chinese labor force began to live up to the myth that it was cheaper to hire and employ than white Americans. The Chinese are the first ethnic group that the United States went after as an exclusionary group. And because of 
the laws that we passed to exclude the Chinese way back in the 1800s, it set a precedence for racism in America in general. Haha, <laughs> I got the R word in there. So it's, you can almost say that the modern racism that we have in the United States today is a mixture of the laws that we passed against Chinese Americans and the laws and statutes that we put into practice against African Americans and free blacks after the Civil War. Um, now, this is the reason we're not going more into that particular topic is because this month is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. I really hope I didn't screw that up. And so we're going to focus on Asian American history to the Asian American and Pacific Islander history this month. And I hope that my goofy makeup, I think it turned out pretty nice actually. I hope my goofy, make, goofy makeup didn't take away from the important lesson that I really hope people picked up from this in that we created a self-fulfilling prophecy by bringing over and inviting over a foreign labor force that we then vilified after it basically outperformed us. And this might be the first time in recorded American history that that happened, but it certainly wasn't the last up until even the modern age when we decided that we don't like Hispanic and Latino workers anymore because I don't know. I still don't understand why we don't like them. Um, but we go out of our way to make people uncomfortable here. Since this is uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and with the recent events that have occurred in the United States um, that have been directly focused on Asian Americans <laughs> and that have come to light. Because saying it that way makes it sound like this kind of violence never occurs against the Asian American population, which it really does. It occurs pretty regularly. We're just aware of it all of a sudden. And on the one hand, I'm really glad that we are because it's nice to see more people aware of it. And on the other hand, I'm sad that it's taken us this long to become aware of the fact that there's groups of people that are, they're silenced even though they are victims of racism in the United States. So, during this Heritage Month, I'm going to be exploring more about Asian American history and archaeology as I can find it, because I'm not going to lie to you guys, it's kind of hard to do. There's not a lot of it out there, and that's kind of irritating. But we're going to look at what there is out there. We're going to explore some more fun stuff out there. We might even, might even, make a field trip out to a ghost town in Pennsylvania, which may or may not be a lumber town, and may or may not have evidence of Asian Americans working there. Maybe, possibly not, I don't know, we'll find out. So stick around, I hope you guys come back. I'll be doing some more makeup looks uh, and flaunting my brand new red hair, literally I just got done dyeing it like 30 minutes ago. And I hope you guys come back to see some cool makeup looks. Give me some advice on makeup, I guess. I don't know. I'm really not good at makeup. I'm an archaeologist. I don't know what you want. Uh, but I do hope you come back for some very interesting Asian American history and Pacific Islander history. And yeah, leave a comment below, like or dislike. If you don't like it, let me know in some kind of way other than you're ugly or you're fat because those are not valid arguments, even though I'm sure I'm going to get at least one. If you are offended, let me know why so we can all point and laugh. And I will see everybody in the next video. Bye.